So welcome everyone. This is a first in a series of webinars and training sessions to help you along when explore, exploring with iNaturalist Canada. This one will focus on using iNaturalist for a BioBlitz. Uh, and this will be catering to existing iNaturalist users. So we're assuming you already know what iNaturalist is and generally how to use it. If you're looking for that kind of information, we have other recordings of other webinars that we did on how to add observations uh, and other basic information. You can see it on the CWF website. This is recorded and available uh, at a later date. The easiest way to find this is to Google CWF webinars. My name is Caitlin Brandt and I am the Digital iNaturalist Technician for the Canadian Wildlife Federation. I'm going to do a quick introduction before handing it over to James Paget. CWF Species at Risk and Biodiversity Program Officer. So next slide, please. We're, we will use the chat uh, to paste links and resources as we go along. For you as the audience, please use this for any technical questions or issues like audio or video problems. If you're having problems hearing, first check your audio settings to be sure your volume is up and Zoom has access to your speakers. In general, if you're having problems, Leaving and rejoining the chat usually works. For questions, we will be using the Q&A feature to answer questions at the end. So please write your questions using this and you can post them throughout the entire webinar series. We won't be able to get to raised hands given the time and number of participants. If you get kicked out for any reason, please try to rejoin. We'd love to have you here. So CWF, the Canadian Wildlife Federation is one of Canada's largest conservation organizations, undertaking projects and conservation across the country. Our mission is to conserve and inspire the conservation of Canada's wildlife and habitats. And we do this in a number of ways. One is through engaging the public and youth in citizen science, like our naturalist, <laughs> education programs like Wild Outside and the Canadian Conservation Corps. Another is through specific programs in freshwater, marine, and terrestrial environments, many of which target species at risk, like the right whale, blending turtle, at risk bats, and the monarch butterfly. So, oh, I'm naturalist. <laughs> Next slide, please. CWF is partnered with Parks Canada, Nature Serve Canada, and the Royal Ontario Museum, together form, forming the iNaturalist Canada Steering Committee. So, with that, I will take it over to James who is going to do pre the presentation. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Caitlin. Um, so uh, everyone heard Caitlin mention iNaturalist Canada. Um, that's because we have, there's a, there's a national or a, a global network, I should say, of, um, of iNaturalist uh, iterations across the world. All of these tie into the, the global iNaturalist network managed by uh, iNaturalist.org. They're based out of the U United States. Um, so in Canada, we have our own version, iNaturalist.ca. There are currently about 18 countries with their own versions of iNaturalist, uh, and there's more in the works, more on the way. Um, and the reasoning for having these uh, individual country specific ones is for one, it can be translated into the official languages of the country. So we have iNaturalist.ca is in French and English. Um, but also it allows us to share um, the, the data, the observation data with, um, for conservation purposes to, to conserve biodiversity. Um, we also on iNaturalist.ca have some specific resources that we've created and put up on um, in .ca and I'll, I'll reference a few of those during this talk. So um, that's kind of why we're encouraging people to um, use the .ca website, but also if you can affiliate your account to iNaturalist.ca and you can do that in your account settings and that allows us to share data more easily for conservation. Um, I'm not going to get into all the specifics of iNaturalist. As Caitlin mentioned, we're assuming um, everybody has a general idea of what iNaturalist is. So um, as we all know, iNaturalist gathers observations that people record at a particular time and location. Um, they upload their photos or sounds um, as evidence to, to show what, what they saw. I share that with the iNaturalist community through the website and the platform. Um, and then those people of the, of the iNaturalist community can help identify or confirm uh, the species that was, that was seen. And you can interact with species experts on the platform through the chats and through um, comments on your observations. 
Um, and uh, in general, um, the better your, your photo or your sound recording is of that species, the more likely it's going to be get some, some good identifications because it's more easy to identify if you've captured those, those good features. So how does this tie into a BioBlitz? So, well, a BioBlitz, what is that? So it's um, basically it's an, an inventory, an event to record as many species as possible at a given location within a certain time period. Participants interact with species experts and fellow nature enthusiasts, other people at the, at the event. People record what they see, the experts help identify what was found. It's kind of sounding similar to what a naturalist is, right? So the functionality of iNaturalist really in and of itself is, is ideal for a BioBlitz, uh, as a, an ideal platform for a BioBlitz because, because it does a lot of what a BioBlitz is looking to do. Now, a BioBlitz can range from um, a very kind of highly scientific and inventory driven event um, to uh, something that's more focused on public participation and engagement. Um, most bioblitzes fall somewhere in between, which has a blend of, of you know, scientists and species experts along with participants uh, from the general public to come, uh, come and observe. Um, and an event can be as big or small as, as you make it, right? It can be as small as uh, you know, an afternoon in your uh, neighborhood uh, with community association or neighborhood association, or it can be as big as a, you know, several hundred people um, participating in a large scale event and over you know, one or more Days uh, and include you know, lots of people from across across different places. And so, why would we have a bioblitz? Uh, well, at first, as I mentioned, it's it's a way to gather valuable conservation or uh, valuable biodiversity information that can be used for conservation. Um, bioblitz can be species specific. So there are, are some that are like um, butterfly bioblitzes or reptile and amphibian bioblitzes. Most often we try and gather um, as many different species as possible. Um, they're also a great way to engage the local community, um, depending on how local you want to be. It can be um, a large community or very, very local. Um, and in doing this, you can kind of showcase an area, maybe a, a place that people don't know about uh, that has a high conservation value in your in your region. And um, make it known, make people come, have people connect with uh, the nature that's there and the, um, the species and, and really kind of get a kind of hands-on experience. And of course, they're lots of fun. Um, Biobuses tend to, you know, have a, a good fun atmosphere, whether it's uh, something we can gather in person or something we're doing uh, virtually online, which I'll talk about later. Um, they, are, they are lots of fun. And uh, to showcase a bit of this, I'm going to show you a little video clip that we put together for BioBlitz Canada uh, back in 2017. And there we go. So that makes everybody want to go to a bioblitz now, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, kind of that showcases a few things that do happen in bioblitzes and, and some of their activities and, and uh, things that participants uh, can, can do and take part in during one of these events. Um, 
So I was mentioning something about virtual BioBlitz. Um, it's not this style of virtual, not at all. It's more uh, whether people can, you know, gather on a specific property in person as a as an on-site BioBlitz at a specific point in time. Usually, it's over a period of twenty four hours, and people can come and go within those twenty four hours, though. Um, versus what we're talking about is a bio virtual BioBlitz, where um, people can record observations on their own to contribute to this kind of this tally, this BioBlitz tally. Um, now it, it can be within the same property. So as we're seeing on this map, you know, there could be a, a location in particular for the BioBlitz and people come maybe over an extended period of time, like uh, over a month or over the summer, people still come on their own and record observations that then get added to, added to your BioBlitz tally. Or it can be something over a large space like the whole country or a specific province and people can explore and add observations from wherever they are. Um, and I'll talk about kind of what those differences are and, and uh, that in, in particular. So, um, you know, each has their advantages. Uh, one obvious in, in these days with the pandemic is um, gatherings either, either can't happen or uh, very limited. So um, this idea of a virtual BioBlitz has really kind of hit home in the last year, uh, along with virtual, a lot of things with like webinars like we're doing now. Um, but, you know, in general, um, an in-person event allows for a bit more of an immersive experience. People can get their you know, hands on, interact with species experts and fellow uh, participants um, and exchange ideas. And it's obviously, it's a bit more of a, of a hands-on connection with um, the local space and people that are there. Um, it can always be done. Um, so the virtual option is also a, a way to go. Um, a virtual BioBlitz too will also, you know, most likely uh, engage a larger audience because you, you're not limited to a local area and you can engage people from across the country, across the province if you want. Um, the, this virtual option though doesn't give, depending on how you run it, um, it won't give you specific information on a given property because it is across the country or a larger area. So um, the type of BioBlitz you're gonna wanna do really depends on your, on your goals. If you're looking for specific information on a local property, obviously you have to go with um, something more um, directed and not kind of a large scale um, public engagement piece. Um, yeah, and you can also do a mix of both, right? You can have a, a kind of a concentrated area where you're really focusing and encouraging people to go and record things, but then allow people to add observations and into the tally from uh, wherever they are across the country. Um, I'm not going to get into like all the details of exactly how to plan and execute a BioBlitz. Um, we have a really good guide that we're actually we're just revising, and it should be up on our on our website at bioblitzcanada.ca in the next like days or even or week. Um, but this this runs through everything you need to know to like plan, organize, think about for a BioBlitz. It's it's a pretty in-depth guide um, and we all, we've updated it to include this idea of a virtual BioBlitz as well, which it didn't have before. Um, but in general, there's a few key things that, that we need to think about when running a BioBlitz. And you basically, for one, you have to have people to run the event, right? You need, you need people and participants and you need um, uh, experts to help uh, identify things um, whether it's virtual or in person, you need a platform or a way to collect the data um, and encourage people, not just the scientists or the, the species specialists to report observations, but everybody who's taking part. Um, you need a venue of some kind, um, whether it is, you know, a site, if it's obviously if it's in, an in-person one, um, thinking about buildings or a tent or facilities. Um, and you have to have a kind of a, a plan or a schedule as to, you know, if you're going to do um, guided walks of what the timing of those would be when your webinars or training or workshops would take place. And obviously you gotta let people know about it so they can uh, attend. So the promotion and, and the um, engagement and the information that you have to put out um, to try and attract your, your audience or your participants. Um, so, you know, why, why am I pushing iNaturalist for a BioBlitz, or why are we talking about iNaturalist? Well, as I mentioned, it, it kind of, at its core, it does what it what a BioBlitz needs, and it helps, is a way to record the data that is that is observed at a BioBlitz. Um, in the past, a lot of BioBlitzes would um, have, you know, spreadsheets or data that's on a computer. Um, with iNaturalist, it makes the information publicly available um, that can be used for conservation decisions, maybe some some conservation that wasn't really thought of by the BioBlitz organizers, but it can be useful for other, um, other uh, conservation needs. Um, 
And so people can, you know, obviously they can take photos, upload them to iNaturalist. The app also one thing with iNaturalist is it works offline. So you don't have to have a data connection. Um, so people can record their observations um, and a photo to vouch for it, especially when you're thinking of people who are maybe aren't specialists and, and don't really feel comfortable trying to identify or, or uh, upload a species if they don't know what it is. Um, so um, the, and then it's a way, so it's a way to vouch for that observation that um, someone made um, for others of the community to help confirm what it is. And with iNaturalist, there are, you know, over or nearly 33,000 people that have helped confirm or identify observations in Canada. So there's a huge community of experts or of, of people that can help identify what was found at your BioBlitz. Um, and it doesn't have to be exclusive to the BioBlitz. It's, it's all observations on iNaturalist. I, I find once people get comfortable with iNaturalist, it kind of it makes that recording observations and, and inventory that traditionally was very scientist or expert um, led, it makes it a bit more accessible to the everyday person. So those people who may have been intimidated um, to report observations and their data, um, they may more apt, be apt to use it when they can know all they have to do is take, take a photo and they don't need to know what the species is. And to help this along, there's the image recognition software with iNaturalist that will you know, provide suggestions of what that species is that the person just uh, observed um, in order to kind of help direct them along and, and maybe help, hopefully make participants uh, feel more comfortable in reporting their observations. So a couple of ways you can make use of iNaturalist for a BioBlitz. Um, the simplest is you can just plan to use iNaturalist during your BioBlitz. Um, and then you basically uh, can use the explore page within iNaturalist. So this is where all the observations are housed in iNaturalist. Um, and you can just see what was observed or is being observed um, during a BioBlitz during that time period. So you can set the filters as we see at the top here, you can select a date um, and you can select your location and basically just look at the observations that were recorded. That's really the simplest way. Um, and if you're just looking at a kind of more, less officially organized BioBlitz, maybe this is a way to go, uh, something to think about. The downside is it doesn't give a lot of stats like you know most observed um, species groups and uh, participants and that. So um, it won't give you as much information as, as you would if you go the route of creating a BioBlitz project with an actress which brings me to this. So this is what a, bio, or a project with an iNaturalist looks like. Um, it essentially gives you a free web page or event page to um, direct people to or to use as your, as your BioBlitz kind of platform. Um, and this is typically what people will do for especially kind of an organized BioBlitz is you'll create a project page and um, be able to direct people that way. It also allows you to uh, communicate with participants through uh, the project journal, um, which when you write journal posts, it'll send an, an automatic email to the people who have joined your project through iNaturalist. And it also appears on, on their dashboard, which is like their homepage within iNaturalist. So it's a way to kind of engage and communicate on like noteworthy finds or um, things to know about, timing of a webinars coming up, um, that kind of thing. Now, as you all know, you can interact with uh, iNaturalist through the iNaturalist uh, app, but also the iNaturalist website. Um, you can view observations through the app and see like that kind of on a place-based uh, type of BioBlitz, but to set up a BioBlitz project, you have to go through uh, the website. So I'm gonna focus now on, on how to set up a BioBlitz project using iNaturalist.ca. Uh, so, Obviously, you have to you have to log in first of all uh, to iNaturalist.ca. So you have to have an account. Um, some of these, this bar at the top that you're seeing here, that's every once you log in, that's everywhere that you go on iNaturalist. You'll see that top bar. Some of these options won't appear until you're logged in. So if you're not seeing some of these possibilities, um, that's probably why. Um, so whether you're using uh, the project method or um, just the, the search method and just kind of and, and using the explore page to um, tally the to see the tally of the BioBlitz um, observations, uh, you need the, the, the boundaries, the area that you're looking to inventory or to record um, has to exist in iNaturalist. This allows you to see all the observations within that area that you're targeting. So you, that, that area has to be mapped. Um, 
Now, if you're not targeting a specific place, so if you're thinking of like a countrywide BioBlitz, um, you obviously don't need to, to set and make, uh, make sure your local place is, uh, is there. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is look into creating a place. So if you, you go to the more um, dropdown and click places, it brings you to this kind of page. The first thing that you should be doing is check in the search at the top right you're seeing, um, check to see if that existing they're called place uh, it, that it already exists or to see if it already exists in iNaturalist. There are a lot already. People have created a lot of places already and there are certain ones that are um, kind of curated that are, are specific um, places already in iNaturalist. Um, the search is a little bit um, finicky in a sense so that you have to kind of get the wording right. Sometimes you search for a place and if you've if it goes by a couple of different names or if it's only part of the word, um, sometimes it might not show up in the search. So just, just ideally try again with a different different word or a different keyword. Um, this kind of places directory is something that is being looked to be revamped in iNaturalist. So I think it's gonna be getting better soon. Um, so we'll be able to search a bit easier and have a better um, directory of places. So the reason I say to search for a place first is because having lots of places in iNaturalist is, is quite taxing on the platform, on the, the system itself. Um, it takes a lot of computational power to, to have all these places amalgamating or pulling in observations. So um, as much as possible, we're trying to make sure we don't duplicate places unless and or create new ones unless it's really necessary. Um, so to kind of ensure help with this, um, Anybody is looking to create a new place. Uh, so if you're searched and your place doesn't exist, there's this option here at the bottom to create a new place. Um, you have to, uh, the, there have to be 50 verifiable observations associated with the iNaturalist account to be able to do this. So if you don't have 50 observations in your account, you won't see this tab at the bottom that won't even show up. Um, this is basically to, because we don't, we wanna have people to be familiar with the iNaturalist platform first before they go and start creating a bunch of places. So to kind of get a sense of what it is and be able to search for iNaturalist before um, going through that. And when I say verifiable observations, that basically means um, an observation that has a photo or sound to vouch for it and a location. So just to avoid people kind of just submitting a whole bunch of species names and saying, yeah, I've got my observations there. So when you click, if you do need to create a new place, when you click add a new place, brings you to this um, create a new place page. Uh, so, and even when you have those 50 observations I was talking about, there's still yet again, this next step of a big kind of yellow warning saying, hey, just think about this before you look to create a new place. And again, it, it reiterates, look for existing places. Um, the other thing to, to, to note is that uh, when you're creating a project, you can add multiple places to a single BioBits project. So if, for example, you're um, looking to inventory uh, you know, a large area and it encompasses three municipalities, then when you create your project, you can add all three of those individually. So you don't have to create one place already that encompasses a three, you can, you can add all those existing ones together. So now if you do absolutely need to create a place, and I think I've made a case for wanting to make sure that we check, to check first, um, obviously you have to give it a name. Uh, remember this name, because you're gonna need to know to, to be able to pull that up later. So I'll talk about that after. Um, the parent uh, basically means where it's housed. So um, this is this is other geographic areas, and I would suggest setting that to the province of where your place is located. This allows it to filter into a directory to know that um, your location is based is then set into Canada. Um, so that when people search for projects, if they're on iNaturalist.ca, they won't see it come up unless you've set that parent to be like the province that then is associated to the country. Um, now you can now you have to have your place boundary. I think the the easiest way if you do have uh, uh, a KML file, which is basically a Google Earth uh, file um, geographic system to uh, that that would have the boundaries of your property. If you have that, that's ideal because then you can click you can go to browse and you can find your file and and upload it that way and it pulls that that boundary straight into the map there and you would see it when you when you do that. If you don't have a file, you can still draw a polygon or a boundary on the map. So to do that, you would uh, click on the polygon drawer that's here, and it'll allow you to click points on the map. Um, 
to finish off your polygon, you can kind of double click and it'll draw a line right to the beginning one. Or if you click again on the first one you started with, uh, it'll close that polygon and create that, um, that boundary. Um, now for both the KML um, option and the polygon drawing option, um, you can have multiple boundaries associated with the same place. So for example, if you have a, a conservation area that's kind of one named conservation area, but it has like three different properties or something like that within it, um, you can draw each three um, and save them as the one place name. Same thing if your KML file has three boundaries already within it, um, you can have all those three as being part of your um, place. Um, you can click uh, to select your place type if you want. You don't have to. Uh, the type is a drop down list of specific um, preloaded options. And it's basically is it a city or is it a conservation area? Is it a park? Um, so you can select that if you want. And when you're done, you click to save your place. Now you're ready to create a project. We've got your boundary set up. Um, and again, we go back to this main menu bar that appears everywhere on iNaturalist. You click under the community uh, dropdown and projects option. That brings you to the projects page where you can, you can search for existing projects uh, if you're interested in and join them through by clicking onto the project page. Um, some, similarly, like, so like projects like Observation Nation that we've created, which is kind of like an ongoing bio blitz uh, nationwide to help engage people to track biodiversity across the country. Um, and engaging people by way of you know, having some contests and some tips along the way and uh, um, previews to webinars like this. So um, if that's of interest to see kind of how that works and um, the, the engaging people with journal posts, you can, uh, you can join the project and, and see what we're, what we're up to and how we've, we've used it in that way. Um, now, when you're looking to create a project, you um, click the green here, start a project button which takes you to a page to um, explain what projects are. Um, now, this, this explains two different kinds of projects. Um, a single bio blitz or something that you're looking to create as, as one location or one event, um, it's what's called a collection project. And this is kind of how it sounds. It collects all observations based on a set of criteria that you put in um, to um, add observations that way. Now, if you have multiple Bioblitzes, for example, if you're doing a province-wide or a country-wide one, you want to add individual ones. This is where the umbrella project might would come into play, um, and basically adds each individual project that has already been created to this umbrella overarching one that then has the kind of global tally or or full tally of all the projects underneath it, and it's a way to kind of compare um, the leaders and and the stats of each individual project as well. So we're gonna look into a collection project. When you click um, start a collection project, there's a um, form, I think it's pretty self-explanatory that uh, allows you to kind of fill in the details to create your project. So obviously you gotta give your project a name. Um, if you're thinking this is gonna be an annual event, like an annual bio blitz, think about putting the year in there so that you can tell which year you're engaging people with if it's if and people can search for it that way. Um, you can include a project banner, which is basically that first image that shows up as you saw with um, here along the top, this type of banner, that's what um, would show up when you um, choose a project banner. Um, and you can use a, an icon, and this is typically if you're an organi organization, you'd use your, um, um, your organization logo, and this is just like a small logo that would, would show up on, like when people search for your project, they'll see that on the list. So it's kind of a way to tie, if you have multiple projects, tie them all together as, as your kind of, organizations projects. Um, the project summary is basically your the description of the event. Um, you can add links within this too if you want to link out to a registration page or other uh, your own website or anything like that. Um, you can embed that into this project summary. Um, the first two sentences roughly are what people are going to see. So those are the ones you're going to want to make sure that you kind of catch people's eye with um, and then maybe have something in there to say click read more, or read more to, to find out all these other details. Um, and then people will click, can click to read more and they'll see the full, the full event description that you have up in here. Um, so now looking down through the observation requirements. So these are the criteria that you set on how observations are gonna be included. Um, so this first one, it can be um, taxa specific like moths. So this is what's happening for National Moth Week that's starting next week actually. Um, so it basically adds all and re restricts it to only, but also adds all uh, moth observations. And we've set the place to be Canada. So 
not we, the, the project creators um, have set the place to be Canada. So um, it'll add all moth species uh, across Canada during the time frame that's set for the, um, for the, the moth week. Um, so if you're, uh, if you're looking at all species, you know, you're looking to target all species in a violet, so you'd want to leave this blank. Um, so now include places. So remember, as I mentioned, remember what you called that place that we created in the last step. This is where you'd start typing in the place name that you created. So once you start typing it in, uh, you'll see it show up and then you click on it and it'll be added as one of the, you'll see it below the include places. And then again, if you want to add a separate one, if you have multiple places within the same um, bio blitz or same um, uh, project, then you can start typing the next one and click that and it'll add all of those places as many as you feel you as many as you need to. Um, similarly, uh, including users. This is if you only if you're only wanting observations from certain people. So this might be more for like a, uh, a science type event where you have certain people that you only want their observations to be included and it doesn't allow anybody else to add to it. Um, keeps your Bible kind of exclusive to just your participants. Um, but if you want to leave it open to just anybody who happens to be on the property or any participant that maybe you don't know of, um, you'd also want to leave this blank. So by setting these, the, the project will automatically add observations within these criteria as you set. So um, uh, in this case, people don't even need to know that you have a project or that there's an event taking place. If they happen to be in the location that you've said and use iNaturalist and meet those criteria, it's going to automatically go into the project. Um, but that won't really work, right? If you if you don't have a specific boundary or taxonomic group, and, and you want to um, include people that are just participating, but maybe happen to be anywhere in Canada or anywhere in the province, um, or if you don't know the usernames of those of those participants. So um, this next option to click uh, display only observations from project members allows only um, people who have joined your project. Uh, it'll automatically add all those observations. Um, and so um, that's a way to engage people beyond those previous criteria we talked about of, of um, location and, and uh, taxonomic species. Um, so those, up, those other ones though will still apply, right? So if it's moth week and um, it's only allowing people that have joined the project, it's only gonna add moth observations from people who have joined. Um, so uh, this is kind of the, the route to go if you're looking at a kind of a, the virtual idea of a bio blitz. Um, the, the caveat is that you're really going to have to let people know that they have to join the project for it to count. So that's going to be something you have to think, right, think about and work into your messaging when you, have, when you promote um, your, um, your project and your, your bio blitz. Um, you can set your data quality if you really, if you really only want what's called research grade observations, which means that they've been um, <clears throat> every observation has been confirmed by at least one other person um, on a naturalist. Um, you can re require that people have sound or and or photos within their observation, or you can just leave it as any. So no matter whether they have a sound or, not, or a photo or not. Um, and you can select if you only really want to include native species or if you only want to include uh, introduced species. Um, and then you set the date. Uh, this can be a specific day only, or it can be a range as uh, it shows there. Now you can click preview to see what the observations in that project will look like, but obviously if your BioBlitz hasn't started yet, it'll be empty. So you won't have any observations there. Some projects, if it's not BioBlitz specific, will wanna add it retroactively. So say like a, a provincial park wants to know, have a project for all the observations within their park. They wanna know from the beginning of iNaturalist until, until now, so they would, um, if you didn't have a date range, you would you would see a bunch of observations already in there once you start uh, to click the preview. And the last couple of things is uh, you can allow people who have joined the project to trust um, you with their uh, hidden coordinates. Um, hidden coordinates basically means so there's a there's there are several species within iNaturalist that are um, automatically obscured and so a randomized point within a pretty large buffer. Um, to keep them safe from uh, poaching or collection or sometimes being over overviewed to, to death um, or disturbed in that sense. Um, but also people, any observation they make on an actress can choose to manually obscure so they can, um, they can do that with any observation uh, on their own. But when, they, when you allow them to trust you with those observations, when they join the project, they can allow you to have access to those and you'll have the true coordinates of, of anything that's added to your project. Um, 
you can also make other people administrators and they would also have access to those true coordinates. So this is if you're, um, you know, have colleagues or you're partnering on a, on a, on a bio blitz, you may want to give everybody else access to um, edit uh, the project as well. So this is what it looks like. Um, once you're done, the project page, as I mentioned, the key message, if you're, um, I mean, whether you have members required to be adding automatically adding for members or in general, you, you're messaging, you're going to want to get people to join your project. That way um, you can engage people through journal posts um, and they'll get those emails, as I mentioned. Um, and it, like I said, it's the only way observations will be added for those members based um, uh, observations. Um, so if you want to check out what a, you know, virtual bio blitz and, and um, a project like this would look like. One good one to start with is the uh, big backyard bio blitz um, being led by uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, uh, along with Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, so starting July 29th, uh, so there'll be some daily um, events and activities and, and webinars uh, or um, online activities um, daily throughout the BioBlitz and it's it's um, along with that people can record their observations and it gets automatically added to the tally so if you want to kind of check it out what it what it's like and and how one of those is run um, you can consider joining uh, this project that's coming up um, so as we see this one hasn't started yet so there aren't any stats in there once a bio blitz starts, uh, you'll see a tally like this. Um, you'll see the, the most observed species, who's got the most observations, um, the location, you see the map at the bottom of, the, of where the observations are coming in from. And uh, the stats as well will show you, if you click on that, you'll see a breakdown of the um, kind of the species, most observed species groups and that um, some extra information about the project. Um, this is basically your, your live, your real time tally of your bio blitz. And so it's kind of your, your um, it updates live. It's kind of your event page for your for your bio blitz. But you need to be able to get from oh, there's the journal post. Um, all, you can see all the past journal posts again. And that's Observation Nation. So you can see kind of how we've guided people along um, that way and helped out with um, a project in a bio blitz setting. Um, yeah, you have to be able to get from here of your project page to having people attend your event and recording observations. So a couple, um, remember those key elements I was talking about before about um, of, of a bio blitz. And as I said, I'm not gonna get into like all the details and that, that uh, bio blitz guide has lots of tips on how to engage people and get them to your event and things you can do for your bio blitz um, at bioblitzcanada.ca. Um, but in general, you have to get people there. You have to have people to help um, run the event and do, you know, if you wanna do guided walks or, or webinars, um, or have um, like a festival type event if you're at, a, at base camp, if you're doing an in-person uh, event. Um, other ways to engage people is to have species experts lined up either for the, these um, you know, guided walks or um, uh, to help with ID, to do maybe video um, Q and A if, uh, if we're not gathering in person, um, webinars and that kind of thing to get people engaged and teach them how to, you know, what to do within the bio blitz. Um, Hands-on events obviously are, are good if as much as we can do. Um, even a live demo, live hands-on demo uh, of a walkthrough or of a survey type thing is something that people can kind of get excited about and get a taste for how to survey an inventory. Um, and uh, something that can be can be done as well is have like a real-time tally on, on a big screen of like the BioBlitz pay your um, iNaturalist project page to see the tally and as they come in in real time to see who you know who's got the most observe observations, the most observed species, and what are what your total number is. And again, promotion will be key, right? You have to get people uh, make people aware of your um, of your project of, of your BioBlitz taking event uh, event taking place. Um, so you know obviously make use of social media. Um, email lists, partners, any way you can get the word out um, for your bio blitz. Um, so specific to iNaturalist, um, once we've got people engaged and, and taking part in your bio blitz, um, something I've found when, when doing these is no matter how much I tell people, you know, just use iNaturalist and record your observations, anybody can participate, you don't have to be a specialist or an expert, we, I, we tend to get uh, a lot of observations from like the top top users, top iNaturalist observers, um, and not a lot from kind of, of everybody else. Um, and you know, as much as I try to encourage that, it, it is it, it tends to shake out that way. So it's really important to make people realize that 
if they know how to take a picture with a digital camera or a smartphone, they can contribute to your bioblitz. That's point final. They don't even have to know what the species is. Is if you can take a picture, you can upload it through a naturalist and um, and contribute, and you don't have to be an expert. Um, a few things that would help that along is uh, like an iNaturalist workshop or webinar before your event to kind of remove that barrier of people like, I don't know how to use the app. I don't know what this is all about. I might not contribute the day of. So if you can do that, like either at the beginning of the event or ahead of it um, to get people, make people at ease with the app or the website. Um, something that really helps as well is to have an iNaturalist booth. Um, so you have somebody there physically um, where people can come and ask questions and you can walk them through the steps if they need some help with um, using the, the platform. Um, and uh, something that kind of helps, I find helps encourage people to come to that is if you have Wi-Fi there, um, that you can have provide Wi-Fi for people who um, don't have data on their phones and want to come and upload their observations. As I mentioned, my naturalist works offline, but to upload them, you have to have a, a data connection. So if you have Wi-Fi for people to come, you can draw them there to upload their observations. Even a phone charging station, if you have power with a few power bars, people can come and charge their phone and get some info from you on uh, on how to use iNaturalist and some of those steps. Um, and at that booth, but also ahead of time, or especially for virtual events, there's uh, you can provide handouts. And we have a lot of those on iNaturalist.ca in the help slash help. Uh, and so in the help section, there's a bunch of these handouts and in our resources section that Anybody can have their PDFs, anybody can download and use to either have printed on site or to send out um, digitally for people to walk them through how to use the app and the website. Um, and so um, those are a few ways to kind of help people along and encourage them to be to be using iNaturalist um, at your at your BioBlitz. And that's um, kind of a quick rundown of, of thinking of like the BioBlitz from the planning and setting up your project right through to um, how to engage with people on site. And as I mentioned, there's a lot more to it than just this little bit that I've, I've touched on. So um, that guide uh, helps explain a bunch of it. And we're, we're developing now a complementary guide to our BioBlitz in a box, which is specifically how to use iNaturalist for a BioBlitz, which is walks through written uh, all these, a lot of these steps that I talked about it from how to create your project and how to think about engaging people with iNaturalist. So, that's to come and we're still kind of putting the finishing touches on that, but it'll be kind of a, a partnering accompanying guide with to the bio blitz in a box. Um, and with that, I've, we've got some time for, uh, for a few questions here. And I haven't been checking the q and I don't know if Caitlin has probably been responding to a few as we go, um, but if there are any kind of key ones that maybe you think others should hear the answers to as well, we can uh, re-answer them live if people haven't read, up, read on those Q&A. Yeah, I've been answering a few. Uh, I have one here from the owner of a conservation area project, and they wanted to know if they organize a one day bio blitz, can we have a page with the stats from that day only without modifying their original pro collection project? Mm, that's a good question. Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, so you, you could modify your original collection project um, just for that day and then you could change it back afterwards. So all changes once you, so you can go in and which I didn't mention, once you created your project and you go to your project page again, if you're the administrator, there's an edit button. So you can always change your project at any point in time. You can change the name of it too and it still keeps everything the same. Um, so one option could be you could change your project to those dates of that one day. And then when it's done, you change it back. Um, the other option I think would have to be, you'd have to create a second collection project. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple yeah, other questions here. Maybe you have different ideas to me on these. So I would like to change the borders of a project I already have. Uh, they made a mistake on the project boundaries. How can they change this? Yeah, uh, again, with the edits. So once you go back to your project page, you can edit your project and you scroll down to those, those places. Um, um, and then you can just change it. You can delete a place uh, that was already there and you can add a new add a new one. So you just have to know the name of the one you want to have there. Um, if you are the creator of that original place and it's wrong, um, I would suggest um, just modifying the original place and then it'll update automatically your project boundary. So if you're 
example, you drew a boundary wrong, you added it to your project and you realized after the fact you needed a bit different. If you go back and, and edit your place back in the places tab page in iNaturalist, it'll update your project as well. So that's probably the simplest if it's if you're the owner of the place and you can change it. If not, um, you could, you'd have to create a new place or search for the new place um, and add it that way. Great, thank you. I'll just go through a couple of the other questions so everybody can hear the answer. Um, are there a limit to the number of people who can join a project? Are there limits to the number of observations in projects? Yeah, no limit. Um, you could, I don't think it's valuable, but you could essentially mirror iNaturalist website and have adding all observations across the country from everybody on iNaturalist which I don't think is a big value in it because it just duplicates the site, but essentially it can be done because it, it, and that, especially with the collection projects, that part doesn't slow down the iNaturalist platform, which is good because it basically just points to the observation, doesn't physically kind of move anything around. So you could do that. So there's really, there's really no limit. Great, thank you. And I think that's all we have. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, please put them in the chat. Maybe we'll wait, wait a minute because we have a bit of time. Uh, there's a question here uh, talking about glitches in iNaturalist, bugs in iNaturalist. Um, it says that they seem like some of their posts are not showing in the right species until they click on that species itself and iNat corrects itself. So I'm not too sure what you mean by that? Maybe James, you know? Yeah, I'm not sure which, what you mean, what it's meant by posts. Um, on the species, yeah, I'm trying to look at that too. I'm not, I might need a bit more clarification on what that situation is to know how to answer. Um, if you're thinking of comments when someone adds a species and you're commenting on um, an observation itself, um, it should always line up with the species itself, but um, yeah, I'd have to know a bit more info. And if there is an actual glitch, we can kind of, I can bring it up to the developers at iNaturalist.org too to figure out as well. It's always really helpful to have that information so we can fix it. Okay. Oh, we haven't had anything else come in so far. Okay. Well, if um, if there are any other pressing questions, um, try and get them in quick, because other than otherwise, we can uh, kind of wrap it up. Um, oh, I we see. We have one more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, are the experts and other projects generally paid, or do they generally volunteers? Um, retirees often volunteer, but working biologists can't afford to donate their time. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. And that's, that comes up a lot when we were planning our bio blitzes. Um, when we're thinking of the, like kind of experts in the iNaturalist community and people are on the website, that's easier. And, and people just generally just offer their time and, and IDs. If you're thinking about experts at a site, there's a section in our bio blitz guide that talks to that. Like, and it, it is a balance. So sometimes it's a good idea to plan a bio list to run from like a Friday to a Saturday, because that way the Friday, if, if the, the organization is okay with it, the experts can come on work time, essentially. Um, so they can be paid in that, in that sense, obviously, if, the, if, if your organization is okay with that. Um, the other option is to offer a stipend. Um, and that does happen with some bio lists where you actually pay species biologists, um, species specialists to attend. Um, it's a bit tricky because you can get into that situation of like when they start talking and they're like, well, I got paid to be here. And then the other person's like, well, I didn't. It's a fine balance. So you have to kind of draw a line of, of distinguishing when you would pay someone and when not. And we've thought of kind of a good line or a good line if you have budget for it is like, so if you've got somebody doing uh, work above and beyond just participating. So maybe if they're leading a guided walk uh, or they're leading a group the group leader maybe would get paid because they're doing something specific for the bio blitz and a bit more kind of above and beyond participating. Um, so it's really going to depend on, on who you're inviting and uh, your budget and, and kind of where you can draw that line. Thank you. Uh, how would we reach out for help later on after this webinar? 
Yeah, uh, so you can always get in touch with uh, me. I think my info is at the beginning, um, uh, or you can email CWF's general info, but uh, my email address is jamesp at cwf-fcf.org. Um, and as I mentioned, there's the help section of iNaturalist that runs down all like a lot of information on how to use iNaturalist. There's other webinars, as Caitlin mentioned at the beginning of, of how to use iNaturalist. There's an hour long session of just using the platform. Um, and the BioBlitz on a guide, uh, BioBlitz in a box guide is another kind of spot for help, but um, you can always reach out directly to us at CWF too. Great, thanks. Uh, does iNaturalist emphasize native species over introduce? Is it worthwhile to collect both of these? Yeah, it is really worthwhile for both. Um, and we're, we're actually in discussions and partnering right now with the Canadian Council on Invasive Species. Um, um, and um, basically we wanna still know if it's non-native um, uh, because we wanna be able to track the spread of non-native species. And iNaturalist is a great platform for that when people are recording things across the country and everywhere they are they're gonna come across some of these non-natives and potentially invasive species. Um, we do definitely tend to request or, or have people report um, um, uh, non, like wild species, so not captive or cultivated. So basically um, as little as possible recording garden plants and stuff, but things that come visit your garden plants, for example, are, are good. Um, but definitely non-native is, is something we're, we're looking to do and it helps track um, invasive species. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna put your contact information in the chat, if that's okay for everyone. Yeah. Okay. I think we have a couple of other questions about uh, an ecosphere and also list questions. I don't know if you can help with those. Yeah, I'm looked at seeing the one about lists or life lists. I, I'd have to kind of have more details on the specific situation. Um, uh, yeah, I'd have to kind of know that those details. Um, the question on the ecosphere, that's not us. Um, I don't know, uh, I don't know about that event in particular. Great, thanks. I think those are the last questions we have. And I put James' uh, email address in the chat for everyone. Great. Okay, well, um, thank you for everyone. Oh, okay, I see. I'm seeing the, the question about the life lists. The general stock showed us foe and not their own. Yes, that has been a question. It used to be that in your own life lists, this is kind of not violets related, but anybody who's interested, um, which is a function of iNaturalist, if, if you, you would have your own observations, your own species showing. Um, iNaturalist.org changed this, and I don't, I, I kind of heard the rational why, but um, they want to show kind of an example species, uh, or example observation of that species within the life list. That was a decision that they made, and, and there have been discussions about the benefits and maybe changing that back, but yeah, that's, that's not changeable at this point in time. Great. So, um, yeah, I, I want to thank everybody for taking their time this afternoon and uh, morning, depending on where you are in the country, and uh, and listening in. And hopefully, that's that's helped people along. Um, and as I said, have a look for the the BioBlitz in a box guide. Um, I think it's it's pretty pretty thorough as to um, how to kind of plan and execute an event. Um, but also, yeah, you can get back in touch with us. Um, and yeah, I want to thank everybody for participating. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today and for all the really good questions. Uh, we hope it was really helpful. Yeah, and this this was recorded and it will be, as Caitlin mentioned at the beginning, if you missed any of this or needed to listen again, um, it's recorded and it'll be on our uh, CWF website. So um, Googling CWF webinars is probably your best, best way to find it. Great. Great. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Bye, everyone.